In a world almost forgotten sits the majestic Grand Library of Saw Phoebe. Full of knowledge and hope, it straddles two city nations full of tension. Six unlikely heroes are amongst their midst when a fire breaks out. Will they succeed in saving the library? This is Librarians and Dragons. Part 2. Our heroes converge, and the fire begins. Audience, we have remaining the woman, the, the warrior, and the foreigner. Who would we like to see next, audience? Drop it in the comments. Foreigner. Okay, I see foreigner first. So we're going to move on to inside the library now as we see a man, again, very exotically dressed and with a very austere kind of almost regal or noble air about him as he walks hands folded behind his back, perusing through the local history section, the local history of Sort and of Phoebe. Standing not too far from this gentleman is perhaps a artificer gnome who is going to be played today by Selena. Why don't you introduce your character as you're standing next to this strangely dressed gentleman. Now, you may be a foreigner yourself. You're not obligated to be from these lands. But why don't you go ahead and tell us who you are? My name is Banksy Paraduthwar. I am an artificer, an alchemist. I'm a gnome. I'm always looking for a way to make things better. Doesn't Sometimes in my quest to make things better, I lose track of what is already okay because, you know, the joy of creation overtakes me and I forget all reality and I'll make devices that no one really needs, but they look pretty and they're shiny. So bureaucracies are my nemesis. I really hate anything that's slow and has order because that's just another way of saying boring. And for those who are curious, Banksy is non-binary because gender is a human convention and gnomes don't follow with those sort of things. So. That is very true. And actually in the world of D&D, the same goes oftentimes for dwarves. So dwarves and gnomes are, are of the same ilk in that regard that the women in the dwarf society have just as long beards as the men do. And it's really not distinguished because it doesn't matter to them. So Banksy, sorry, could you pr pronounce your last name for us one more time? Para de Thwar. I'm just going to call you Banksy. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it, Banksy. Is quite, it is quite difficult to pronounce my name if you are not a gnome. That is true. Gnomes have very long, sometimes obnoxiously difficult to pronounce names. Banksy, what brings you to the library today? I mean, clearly you're not really much for bureaucracy. So what what are you doing here today? Well, while I do not subscribe to the bureaucracy, the library has many small corners of knowledge that I, ne that I need. So I always like to look around and find new things and see what other people have done and how I can make it better. With you and your foreign garb, perhaps you have some amazing knowledge that I lack. Ah, pleasure to meet you, says the man, if I may ask your name. My name is Banksy. Ah, greetings, Banksy. My name is Lord Vorbis. I hail from the faraway city of Anoya. I am simply here browsing the local history. I have been intrigued as men of intellect such as myself and noble background often are by grand structures, especially ones which house knowledge. I see you are here with me in the local history section. Perhaps you are interested in the past of this city-states of Sort and Ephibi. No, I really like to just find the secret rooms. Ah, secret <laughs> rooms. Well, as a foreigner myself, I am not quite familiar with the ins and outs. Perhaps you and I can take a stroll around and see if we can find anything fascinating. Perfect. I love strolling and examining and sometimes they kick me out because I start pulling up the floors, but there are secret passages here. I know it. Well, interesting. Why don't you roll an investigation check for me, Miss Banksy? Now, an investigation check again is going to be with our D20. And on your sheet, you're going to have an investigation modifier. As a gnome artificer, you're probably going to be pretty good. And I'm going to give you advantage because Vorbis is assisting you. 
whenever two players oh are good because my first roll was a one and that was not ah uh, <laughs> well hopefully your luck will turn around let me see what my modifier is before before i go too far hold on i'm doing an investigation check yes yes please okay so does that go against intelligence or intelligence so if i have okay. i think i have your sheet here it looks like you've got a plus five plus... on investigation yes cool all right so you're okay. gonna roll that oh i got a 20. a natural 20. <laughs> yay <laughs> wow i saw somebody yeah everybody round of applause natural 20s are always to be celebrated somebody in the comments hit it on the head before we're getting all of our natural 20s out of the way when yeah. they're not really that important all right well you know you can't argue with the role so you find in fact you and vorbis stumble upon a strange looking bookshelf and you can't help but notice that where the book that should say the history of Sword and a Phoebe of a hundred years and prior should be is a children's coloring book instead. This is interesting. That doesn't look like that goes there at all. I wonder what Whoa. happens if we pull it. Perhaps this is and... exactly what I've been looking for. You go ahead and you pull it. And as all Scooby-Doo fans will know, this is a <laughs> secret passageway as you pull upon the children's Score. book that clearly does not belong and the bookcase opens out you are in a very closed off section of the library where there's not a lot of foot traffic so you are able to access this area without anybody seeing you and you and vorbis go down a passageway towards a large subsection of the library filled with books that are more religious that talk about the history of Sword and Ephebe prior to the building of the library. They are old and dusty, and it doesn't seem like they have seen the light of day for quite some time, almost as if somebody is purposely keeping them out of the public's eye. Interesting. I was about to say the exact same thing. How curious. Also, where Very are all the shiny things? Since you rolled in that 20, you also see shiny gold pieces on a desk in the far corner of the room. Now these, of course, do not belong to you, but you count out 15 gold in the corner. Well, I Vorbis found it. Turned, <laughs> yeah, well, Vorbis kind of like turns, turns his head a little bit and pretends to be browsing through these books. You pick up the gold or are you gonna, do you leave Oh, definitely. Gold? It's All shiny right, so. and it's there. It's mine. Gnomes who bypass stealing would be, you know, drummed out of the culture. That's just, hello? That's very true. Yes. Yeah, so you you pick up 15 gold. You also notice other shiny objects. If gold is not all that interests you, there is a, a weight, like a, a scale, like we would see justice carrying, which is quite shiny and metallic and lovely. And other implements, perhaps for seeing things, you know, like what we would think of as like a microscope, not, not a laboratory microscope, but like a Sherlock Holmes, you know, scope, which also is quite shiny and reflects the sun. I will take those as well. All right, you grab them and you throw them in your pouch, adding them to your inventory. And we're going to leave the, the hidden section of the library that I definitely did not just make up off the top of my head. <laughs> As we go to our, this is D&D folks, it's all improv. As we're gonna go to our next, we have two remaining people audience to choose from. So we have the soldier and the beautiful woman audience. Who would we like to pick on next? Do we have any votes? Let's see. Five five E gnomes are not like Kender. Kender are like animaniacs, basically, who can just pull stuff out of a hat. Gnomes are they're similar. They can be kind of tricky, but they are magical. But they are they do tend to be more intelligence based than Kender do. All right, I see a vote for the soldier. Two votes for the soldier. So we go over to our soldier outside on the sortian side of the library, and this soldier is apparently training a host of sortian guards. And watching this training session are, are two other individuals, in addition to the bystanders who happen to be there. We have Michael's character as well as Amelia's character. So Mike and Amelia, you guys are outside the library on the Sortian side and watching the spectacle of guards training. Why don't you go ahead, let's start with Mike first. Go ahead and introduce your character, who you are, what you look like. What are you doing there? What are you, who are, you know... What are you interested in? Well, my character is Arvan Batral, and he is a Vildakin rogue. He was born into kind of mid-tier royalty, wanted for nothing, but he always found himself more interested in the seedy nightlife that was going on outside of the palace. So 
he can kind of walk between two worlds. He, you know, he can walk the walk when it comes to the royal court, but he can also go and play a good game of dice outside, pick somebody's pocket, you know, get into trouble. He loves good drink. He, you know, he's just decided one day that he was going to forego the royal life and go explore. Are you a native to these lands or did you, you said you came from other lands and you, you settled down here? Oh, no, I am just traveling right now. I'm not native to them. I am actually the Duke of the Valdokin Gold Golden Marshlands. So, wow, um, interesting. Mm -hmm. Technically, but I don't put on airs about it, you know. Clearly, rogues are not known to make a big show of themselves. They tend to stick to the sidelines a little bit more. Although yeah, rogues are also very charismatic. So when they want to turn on the charm, usually when it comes down to, you know, rolling dice and things like that, they do excel. <laughs> Uh, yes, and for those of you who don't know, Vidalkins are a strange bluish-hued race of amphibious creatures. Great. Nice. Thank you. And it's Arvon Batrell, right, you said? Correct. All right, Arvon. And nearby Arvon is Amelia's character. So if we could let her describe herself. Hi, I'm Daffodil. I am a halfling, a healing halfling. I'm a hermit. I do not wander outside quite often, and my companion, Slow, the giant tortoise, is kind of the only thing alive that I speak to. I have wandered in, in perhaps looking for more information on medicines and herbs as I can teach these skills that I've learned during my quiet seclusion. I am not interested in communicating with the soldier. I am not interested in communicating with anyone. I just want to go into the library and get out. Mm, okay, a very quiet hermit-like character. So Daffodil is playing a druid who are very attuned with nature and usually more at home with plants and animals than they are with people. So no surprise there that you are not really super interested in, you know, interacting with people. Arvon, are you interested in, uh, do you do you speak to this soldier or are you just kind of watching the show? I'm watching the show. I, I worry that if I speak to the soldier, he'll start asking too many questions. I don't necessarily mm. always get along very well with the authorities. So I'm, I'm ah. more keeping tabs on his presence as opposed to wanting to engage. However, the beautiful okay. woman in the corner, I would always be happy to talk to her. All right, well, we'll, we'll go to her next. You do notice... Well, sorry, by beautiful woman, there is the beautiful NPC or non-player character I described, or are you referring to Daffodil, the lovely halfling druid? No, uh, the, the the NPC that I'm talking to, yeah. NPC woman, okay. We're surrounded by a lot of beautiful people in this chat right now, so yeah. we have to be very specific when we're talking about beauty, because everyone here is, is beautiful. Very true. I will say, though, it's an awesome turtle, so props. It is an awesome turtle, and I love your cloak, Amelia. That is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. So you notice this uh, this little halfling druid skirt off towards the library in the same direction that the beautiful woman is heading. But on your way towards the library, both Daffodil and Arvon, go ahead and make a perception check. So that's going to be a d20. And then under your skills, rogues and druids both tend to be pretty perceptive. So hopefully one of you will get a decent roll here. Got a 14 plus a 2, so 16 total. Very good. I got an eight and then I have plus six. Wow. Plus six is not messing around. All right, so you both are able to hear fairly well. Arvon slightly, slightly better, but both of you are able to hear as you walk away from this kind of intimidating very gentleman is heard commanding orders from his troops, obviously, you know, regular training, but kind of under his breath between commands with your very high perception, the two of you are able to hear some of his mutterings. He says, training all day this is a waste of time we shouldn't be practicing jabs and holds and keeping the peace at this bloody library we should be preparing for the inevitable war between us and the Ephebans, or any of these outside interlopers coming in to take over our lands this is a waste of time this library isn't doing anybody any good people read and learn things eh, pick up a spear that's what i say Stand your post. And he continues this disgruntled muttering as he commands his troops. And the two of you walk away, entering inside the library where Daffodil, you're kind of sticking to the corners a little bit more, avoiding people. Mike Arvon strutting in with a bit more roguish noble confidence. 
as you find the uh, the target of your affections. Arvon, you espy this beautiful woman who has entered the library. You take little note of the small little druid that seems to be kind of just sticking to herself, maybe staying nearby. But next to this beautiful woman, you see perhaps another very charismatic gentleman or person who is also perhaps trying to gain her attention. This mm. is our final player character of the day. This is Marco's character. Marco, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself standing inside the library. Tell us who you are, what you look like, and if you're interacting with this woman or if you are more interested in something else. Hey, hey, yeah, I'm playing Tayatsen de Maderas. He is this well-kept, well-dressed, everything is ironed out, All the, there's no wrinkles on his clothes. He has this kind of purple vest. Everything else is this kind of like muted kind of black, not very saturated looking color. He has like this kind of over cloak that just kind of flows behind him wherever he walks. And uh, yeah, he's just kind of pretending to browse the collections, just kind of waiting, I guess, for an opportunity to to make a move, to approach the, the beautiful woman here. All right, so we've got a, a love triangle going on here. Marco, <laughs> this might be your, your moment or not. It depends, you know, how eager you are, but you see this devilishly handsome Vidalkin rogue start to move towards the woman. Arvon, are you going to just step right in there or are you going to, do you see competition as something to be kind of leaned away from? I, I disregard and I just go for it. All right. Do I have an opportunity here to make him look a little foolish? <laughs> But you sure do, yes. <laughs> okay, if, if I have this opportunity, I would like to, I don't know, pens, you can trip on a pen if it rolls under your feet. I would like to just very, <laughs> very <laughs> quickly just kind of roll a pen under his feet and see if he can trip on that. Okay, you also have the cantrip known as Gust, which is like a very small burst of wind. So if you want, you are, right. by the way, Marco is, Marco is playing a sorcerer, by the way. Yes, um, you're right. A, a, human, a human sorcerer, I believe. So just for some flavor, let's say that you roll this pen on the floor or this quill and you add a little gust because, you know, it's a feathered quill as most writing utensils are in this time. And the wind mm -hmm. will certainly pick it up and assist you in tripping this gentleman. So Marco, why don't you go ahead and roll an arcana check to see how well you can manipulate the wind to accomplish what you want to. And at the same time, Arvon, I'm going to have you roll a dexterity saving throw, which Dang. is above the skills same rules apply you roll a d20 and right above the skills you'll see the section of saving throws and as a rogue you're probably gonna have a pretty high dexterity save i think i see a plus four for you okay so a d20 plus four correct Got it. and for marco you're gonna roll arcana which is a d20 and your arcana modifier looks like a plus three that's under your skills all right this is a roll off ladies and gentlemen so we'll see who gets higher <laughs> Audience, feel what? free to vote on which of these two strapping gentlemen you want to take the hand of this lovely lady. <laughs> I roll a 10 plus the 4 for a total of 14. Okay. Pretty good. I rolled a 1 plus 3. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a natural failure. A natural one is a crit <laughs> fail. So, Marco, despite your best efforts, you use this gust of wind, but instead of blowing it towards the quill to put it under the walking path of Arvon the Rogue, you instead blow up the skirt of this lovely lady Marilyn Monroe style <laughs> and she holds it down, you know, just like in the famous picture and looks around, not really too much in embarrassment, actually, almost like oopsie tootsie kind of thing. Kind of like she likes the attention as Mike, you stroll right up to her and maybe you give Sorcerer a little bit of, of a sideward glance. It's not <laughs> too pretty obvious with a natural fail of a nat one that he was attempting to use magic to embarrass you. Mm -hmm. So you stroll past him, and what do you do? Do you are you going to interact with him or the woman? Oh, well, I, I pick up his pen, I go over to him, I shake his hand, and say, "Hello, I'm Arvon Batrell. I believe that you dropped this." And as I return his pen to him, I want to see if I can pick his pocket. Ooh, make a sleight of hand check. Picking <laughs> pockets always a thing in D and D. Hayatsin, yes. Roll a perception check. Okay. Minus one. And while they're doing this audience, feel free to vote. Do you want the pickpocket to win or do you want the naughty sorcerer to catch him in the act? I roll a two plus a four for sleight of hand, so only a six. And oh I got a six minus one, so five. Wow. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> low. Nasty rolls. All right, so Arvon, even with a fairly amateur attempt at sleight of hand, <laughs> the sorcerer is clearly too embarrassed by his pathetic display to notice that you sneak up behind his sorcerer robes 
and manage to extract his gold. How much gold do you have on you, Tatsian? I see on your sheet, it looks like, Arvon, it's not too lucrative of a day. It looks like Tatsian only has five gold on his person. Yeah, it's yeah, still a so, free drink. It's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple, yeah. Oh yeah, five right. gold will go a long way at the bar for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I turn back to the lady and introduce myself. Uh, Hello, my, my lady. My name is Arvon Patrell. I am the Duke of the Belbalkin Golden Marshlands. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Well, gentlemen, what a what a handsome Vidalkin you are. So nice to meet you. She extends a dainty hand out to you and like kind of turns away like she's very much expecting, you know, some decorum here. What do you do? Kiss her hand. Okay. Ah, she seems flattered by this. She kind of like waves a fan in front of her face acting as dainty, as innocent as possible. She says, well, handsome Vidalkin, my name is Ellen of Anoya, and I <laughs> have lived in these parts for quite a while. In fact, well, you might see the jewelry upon my hands. And she holds up both of her hands, and on both of her ring fingers are two different, very ornate looking rings. She says, these are my two wedding bands. You see, I was picked up from my home many years ago, and, well, I didn't really have a great life there. I was more than happy. As the two rulers of these lands fell madly in love with me, as if there's any doubt as to why. And she kind of looks around for some, some, some approval, and she says, The two emperors were in quite a big scuff in those days. And they were looking for ways to manage their two city-states so that they wouldn't go to war. So they decided on a somewhat unconventional setup where they whisked me away from my boring life back in Anoya and brought me here to sort in a Phoebe. And we had two weddings. They were spectacular. So I'm married to both Emperor Tweedledeedalus and Emperor Tweedledumdeedalus. And I have all the lavishes of a fancy lifestyle that one would expect. I get to come and go as I please. I love this library. It's so pretty and I get lots of stares. I don't really read the books per se, but I like to look at the pretty pictures. And of course, flirt with any young gentleman who may cross my paths. And she looks furtively at both the sorcerer and the rogue at the same time. <laughs> I <laughs> I roll my eyes at, and I, I look at Daffodil. I'm like, can you believe this guy? <laughs> can I investigate the rings? Can I learn more about the rings? Yes, you can rings? roll it. Yes, you can roll a history check. Investigation would, I mean, this is fine if you want to, but investigation would require you to actually like go up and like take her hand and like investigate them. So you can. Yeah, no, you I, want. I want to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I'm getting in her space. It's shiny. <laughs> I want to know. Oh, oh my. Oh, 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 excuse me. Oh, okay. All right. She holds her hands out. Yes, they are quite beautiful, aren't they? And you can roll an investigation check. So I rolled a 16 plus 1 to 17. That's very good. All right, as these two guys are trying to get her attention, she turns to the halfling druid lady, and you notice the rings are absolutely beautiful. They are quite large, and they are nearly identical looking because they both have the sigil of either Emperor Tweedledaedalus on her left hand and Emperor Tweedledumdalus on her right. So it's got their faces embroidered on them. It's very hard to tell which one is which. The only real way to tell which is the background's color. The Sortian ring from Emperor Tweedledumdalus is red, whereas the Phoebin ring with Emperor Tweedledaedalus is green. And you don't notice anything particularly magical about them. They appear to be mundane rings that are extremely fancy looking and are obviously wedding bands of sorts to not only show this woman's high stature in society, but also to make it clear that she has been laid claim to by the most powerful lords in the land. All right, so I, I walk away. Oh, well, that was... Did you happen to notice that little halfling that just walked up, grabbed my hand, and then walk away without saying a word? It was quite odd, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite rude. Bad. Quite rude. Yes. All of a sudden, she points her nose up in the air. All of our players are going to now make a perception check. Everybody, if you are outside of the library, so I think maybe Gramada is the only one. I think everybody else went in at this point. So anyone outside the library, you're going to roll with disadvantage, which means that you're going to roll two times and take the lesser of the roll. 
And those of you inside the library, you're just going to roll a regular d20 and add your perception modifier. I'm at a 16 plus 2 for 18. Nice. Six total with disadvantage. You perceive nothing. <laughs> You're you're uh, too busy you're too busy being pissed off at this man to yeah have any any perception. Eleven. Got, sorry, go ahead. Nine and then plus six, so fifteen. Yeah. All right. So if, so above a fifteen, we need above a fifteen. So I think Mike said he got above a fifteen. Yeah, I got. And idea. Amelia. Anybody I have else? a. Twelve. I have an eleven plus four. Oh, oh, so just skirting it under the wire with that gnomish. Perception. Okay, so the three of you, Arvon, Banksy, and Daffodil, as Ellen of Anoya raises her nose and starts kind of looking kind of curiously around, the three of you smell something. And if you rolled above, did anyone roll above an 18? I was at 18. You were at an 18. Okay, so 18 or above. Arvon, in addition to a smell, which smells something like smoke, you also notice some black smoke emerging from under one of the doorways of the library. Suddenly, chaos ensues. <laughs> <laughs> the music. As, as we hear people beginning to scream, it sounds like something is going on. Those of you who were very perceptive, you notice the smell of smoke and acrid fire as shouts begin to emerge from actually from near where Banksy is in that secret underground. Banksy, you were, you know, grabbing your little items and all of a sudden in the stairway above, there was there was fire starting. And you hear shouts of fire, fire, the library is on fire. And after a moment, even those of you outside are able to see flames beginning to lick and start to exit out of the library and consume the agoraphobia all around it. Yes, Jessica Noctigal, flames abound. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to launch into something called a skill challenge. We have a catastrophe on our hands as the grand library of Sor Phoebe, the pinnacle of intellect and knowledge and truth, and also the only peaceful area that is supposed to exist in the city-states of Sort and Phoebe has caught on fire somehow. Now in a skill challenge, we are going to go in initiative order or turn order. So the way that's gonna work is all of our players are going to roll their D20 and on the top of their sheets, right on like basically the top middle area of their sheets, they will see something called initiative. You're gonna add your initiative modifier and instead of calling it out, why don't we put the initiative in the private chat? That's perfect. So for example, currently Selena or Banksy has the highest number with a 15. So you're gonna put Banksy 15 and then underneath that it looks like Daffodil with a 14. And, or you could just put their names in order. The numbers don't actually matter. So while our heroes are rolling their initiatives, I'm going to explain what a skill challenge is. Skill challenge is going to go in turn order, the way that most things in Dungeons & Dragons go. We go one at a time. Now, those of you familiar with D&D are familiar mostly with combat order, wherein you have a certain number of things you can do on your turn. This is not going to be combat. This is a more open scope kind of situation where on their turn, our heroes are going to recognize that they are among the few individuals in this place that have the power to do something about this fire. The pedestrians are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. The other NPCs, by and large, are not equipped to deal with this. They are just scattering and trying to, to save themselves. There are guards who are doing their best to keep some modicum of peace or order and, and escort civilians to safety, but pretty much, our six heroes know that they are more or less all that stands between this fire and complete destruction of the library. So on your turns, heroes, or, well, I can't really call you heroes yet because you haven't really done anything heroic. On your turns, adventurers, you are going to decide what you want to do. And that can be fairly imaginative. It does not have to be like combat where I move five feet this way and I do this exact thing. You can really do whatever you want. However, your chances of success will be higher if you do something that your character is proficient or good at. So take another look at your skills and get a sense of which skills you guys are good at. And on your turn, you're going to roll a single skill check of your choice that has to then relate to the situation and what you're doing. So let me give an example in another situation. So let's say the skill challenge is a, a fight at a tavern broke out. And on your turn, you're going to use the persuasion skill to try to talk everybody down 
and to make everybody kind of calm down a little bit. Then you would roll a persuasion check. And if you beat the number that I have preordained, then you succeed. It's a pass fail course. So all you have to do is come up with what you want to do and roll a number that beats what I have in mind. The only Are we copy... rolling D20s? Yes, this is going to be a D20 okay. skill check. Exactly. So on your turn, you are going to decide what you want to do, and there must be a skill associated with it. So you can do whatever you want, but it has to boil down to a skill. And if you're not sure what a certain skill is or how it works, feel free to ask out loud, and I or the audience can comment and explain certain skills. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory, but the caveat is that a single skill can only be used one time, which means that if Arvon the Rogue uses Intimidation, nobody else can use Intimidation for the remainder of the skill challenge. So, since some of you are completely new to D&D, and you're all new to each other, you don't, you don't, your characters don't even know each other, you guys can talk out of character, out of game, to, you know, about what you might want to do on your turn. You guys can collaborate as much or as little as you want. So, for example, if somebody has a really high deception skill, and they have a really good idea for a deception, but they're not going to go until the end of the turn, or the end of the round, you guys, you can say, hey guys, I would love to use deception. I have a really cool plan. And that way, you know, somebody else doesn't take it from you and you're left with nothing to do on your turn. Now, audience, this is also a chance for you to interact. This is a very volatile situation that our heroes, our adventurers find themselves in. What do you think they should do? Should they focus their attentions on putting out the fire? Should they try to get people to safety? Should they turn to combat and maybe try to knock somebody out? You know, they can really do anything they want. Or should they say, screw it, and just run away? Fleeing is a totally <laughs> an option. However, this is obviously a very dire circumstance. So, you know, it, a lot is on the line here. So audience, feel free to chime in. We've got the initiative order here, which I'll keep an eye on if the audience has suggestions or ideas. Now, when I say suggestions, I don't necessarily mean we want the audience to tell a character exactly what to do. Like, hey, you should you know, cast this spell to accomplish this exact task. But you can give more general ideas of save the people, put out the fire, check, you know, check for the, you know, whatever. And characters, you may ignore the audience entirely, or you may you may choose to to listen to them. So it looks like first up is going to be Banksy. Do you guys all understand the, the rules yeah. of the skill challenge? Yeah. Yes, I have a quick away. question because I have a high perception and a high ability because of the artificer. I could mm -hmm. maybe know where they have the secret water spells for fire, but I thought Dewey might also know because Dewey has grown up here. So I didn't know which of us would be better equipped to maybe find the secret hidden panel that's magically activated to throw water. Because it's a library, of course they have yeah. one. Dewey, would you, do, you, do you have a thought on the matter? Dewey is intimately familiar with the inner workings of the library, having grown up there and having also uh, been of such short stature, so I, I would be willing to help with this. Should so, I just roll for investigation ahead, or sh should I roll for just history that I already knew where it was, is my question. And that's for you, Mr. D. Uh, either one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. You can do either. History would tell you like, if you already knew, investigation would be for you poking around and trying to find it yourself. Well, then I'll go for if history because it's higher. I've, I've got a higher number on history, so I'll just do that. Okay, so, great. And roll. I will say since you are, you smartly enlisted the aid of Dewey. So let's say you run up to this owl and cleric that you see, and you know that she has some, she might have some insight on the matter. I'll give you advantage on the roll as Dewey is able to fill you in. Now, throughout the skill challenge, you guys have to succeed in, you know, putting out this fire or, or, or saving the, the, the uh, on top of this. And as a team, you six need a grand total of six successes versus three failures. So if you fail three times, you lose the skill challenge. Now, that's okay. If you lose the skill challenge, it's not life or death, but obviously there will be consequences. <laughs> I rolled a 12 plus seven, so that's a 19. All right, that is a success. That is our first success. Congratulations. Banksy, you run up to the cleric and you start frantically asking where the water scrolls are. And Dewey, you point her in the right direction. And Banksy, you remember, you know, seeing a map, you know, kind of a, a you are here 
of the library where all the different things are. And you remember with your historical accuracy viewing the section of magical scrolls. And before long, you're able to find a variety of water-based scrolls like shape water and control water, which you as an artificer are not quite as adept at reading and translating. You might have better luck with one of your more arcane characters, but you do pull them out and you start to, you know, do your best to read the scrolls and elicit the magic. And with a 19, you are fairly successful. You start to get little splashes of water coming out of your artificer armor. Artificers, for those of you who don't know, are kind of like a fusion between science and magic. So Banksy, maybe you have like a, a an Omni tool on your hand that turns into a fire hose and starts <laughs> spraying out magical water to douse some of the fire inside the library. All right, great job. That is our first success. This production of Librarians and Dragons was brought to you by the East Brunswick, New Brunswick, Piscataway, and South Brunswick Public Libraries. Our dungeon master was Adam Samter of Tabletop Now. Enjoy other adventures on the EBPL Podcast Network by visiting ebpl.org backslash podcast.